the leaking of millions of documents, um, the so-called Panama documents, um, are fascinating from the viewpoint that um, they shed a light on um, particularly Ukrainian politicians. We've known for at least two decades that um, offshore tax havens are an important part of the Ukrainian economy. After all, Cyprus has been Ukraine's biggest foreign investor for, uh, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe longer years. British Virgin Islands has also been like number four, number five, um, and that's the most popular tax haven. So it's not not a surprise completely that uh, Ukrainians figure um, in these. There's apparently 20 Ukrainian names. We don't know all of the names yet, but uh, we know that there are 20. Um, one of them is, of course, the most probably the most scandalous, which is President Petro Poroshenko. Um, but we've known for long that um, gas tycoon Dmitro Firtash already is, is, is also based there. Um, and today there were revelations that former Prime Minister Nikolai Azararov um, and party of regions um, henchman, a former hitman from the 90s called Yuri Ivan Yushchenko, also has um, their dealings there. I, I'm not completely surprised if we take a broader perspective um, because um, West, Western countries in general have adopted a very duplicitous and hypocritical stance on corruption towards Ukraine, whilst um, the US and in particular the European Union has kept calling for Ukraine to fight corruption. At the very same time, individual members of the European Union, particularly Cyprus, which is a, a major kind of laundromat for uh, dirty money, but also Britain, France, Austria, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, not all members of the European Union, but certainly members of the European Free Trade Agreement, all um, have benefited from massive outflows of, of capital from Russia, Ukraine, and that part of the world. One Kiev Post report, a very lengthy investigation of Poroshenko and the Panama documents, claimed that um, a Ukrainian anti-corruption watchdog um, had calculated something in the region of $11 billion a year fleeing from Ukraine. Now, um, certainly we knew it was very high, we didn't know it was that high. Uh, from Russia, it's not unexpected because they have oil, gas, um, gold and diamonds, which can be resold on a massive profit margin in the West. Ukraine doesn't have those resources, so it's a bit more surprising. Um, but certainly we know billions have escaped. And to put this into context, uh, Ukraine has had nine IMF assistance programs since, two, since 1991, um, and this amount that has flown out of Ukraine since 1991, so we're talking $200 billion plus, um, is greater than the amount Ukraine received from the nine IMF programs. So that puts it in perspective. Um, Ukraine, in many ways, wouldn't need the IMF programs if if tax paying was was um, was was undertaken by all sectors of society. But what you have in Ukraine is a situation where the elites, um, political and economic, and of course they're very closely intertwined, um, send their capital abroad to avoid taxes, and this is certainly what Petro Poroshenko has done. Um, and um, like many people in Panama um, and to other places in Western Europe and the Virgin Islands, whereas the lower lower ranking Ukrainians who can't do that just simply avoid paying taxes and they exist in the shadow economy, which has been a stable 50 percent of GDP for the last 20 years. So the shadow economy isn't something that suddenly appears as often it does in Western democracies during times of economic recession, when unemployed people go and paint houses and take cash in hand for jobs like that. This is a stable situation in Ukraine. So hence, low tax uh, payments 
from all sectors of society um, has been there for a long time. Uh, Ukrainians don't pay taxes, whether at the bottom or at the top. There's tremendous distrust towards state institutions. It's a vicious circle. If you pay taxes, they think it will be stolen or sent abroad. And this leads to budgetary crisis, which then leads to Ukrainian governments asking the IMF for financial assistance. And this has been going on every three, four, five years since 1991. Um, and this leads to the starvation of resources, financial resources, in key sectors of the economy, education, social services, pensions. And, of course, we saw in the last two, two or three years in particular the Ukrainian military. So that's the, the background. Um, in some, I'm not a lawyer, and uh, Ukrainian law anyway, as I tweeted, is very malleable, and Ukrainian lawyers will, I'm sure, always find a way to sneak out of um, any kind of criminal convictions or judgments. So I'm not going to give a legal perspective on what President Poroshenko did. And in some ways, it doesn't really matter. Um, because what matters is perception. Perception at home amongst Ukrainians and perception abroad amongst key Western countries, which uh, at a time when we already have Ukraine fatigue setting in, as we did after the Orange Revolution in around 2007-2008. So perception is the most important um, factor here. And it, 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 what the revelations show is that um, President Poroshenko hasn't come to power with the intention of changing the manner in which business and politics is undertaken. We already suspected that by now because, of course, uh, he's in his third year in office. Nobody's gone to jail. You can um, bankrupt the country by stealing everything you, which is not nailed down. You can murder over 100 protesters. You can betray your country and you still don't go to jail in Ukraine. Um, so uh, we already suspect um, not everything was right in the field of fighting corruption, rule of law, changing the manner in which business politics is done, and the Panama documents confirm that. In some ways, they're a bit like the leaking of the WikiLeaks documents towards the end of the Yushchenko era, uh, the WikiLeaks documents, the U.S. diplomatic cables which were released, also shed a light on many Ukrainian politicians um, because uh, many Ukrainian oligarchs and, and politicians went to the U.S. embassy, to the U.S. ambassador, and basically went as if they were going to see a priest in confession. And they revealed a lot of uh, interesting information which they would normally not reveal in press interviews because they never believed that these diplomatic cables would become public knowledge. And that was uh, the, why the shock of Firtash admitting to the U.S. ambassador, William Taylor, that um, he was put into business by Mafia Don Semyon Mogilevich in the 1990s. He admitted this to the U.S. ambassador. This became public, amongst many other issues. Um, and so these documents are kind of, will have the same same kind or similar kind of resonance in Ukraine. So perception is key. Um, and when you have a situation where Ukrainians across the board, Eastern and Western Ukrainians, have for two decades had very low public levels of trust in state institutions, in their governments, and in particular in their political parties and political leaders. Remember on the Euromaidan how um, the, the, the protesters didn't want the opposition leaders to take control or to have centre stage. They were, there was a strong kind of antipathy towards the opposition leaders um, at the time, to Klitschko, Nabok and Yatsenyuk. Um, and so uh, that's not surprising, therefore, that this perception, which will be added to by the revelations about, uh, about Petro Poroshenko, will deepen that level of distrust towards Ukrainian politicians. And uh, I've been predicting this for a long time now. Um, I don't believe that Petro Poroshenko has a chance for a second term in office. Um, and I think that he will... Um, I already said a, a week ago in an interview in Kraina magazine in Ukraine, 
Um, and this has been, I think, in, in even more so confirmed by the leaking of these documents. But I don't believe um, that uh, uh, Petro Poroshenko will be able to come uh, become Ukraine's George Washington. We hoped it would be Viktor Yushchenko. That didn't happen. It's not going to be Petro Poroshenko either. And he's going to go down in, in history also in a very negative way, in the same way as Viktor Yushchenko. But I think Petro Poroshenko will, will have a worse fate than Yushchenko um, because Yushchenko came to power after a very peaceful orange revolution. Nobody died and there was no war and conflict and the economy was booming. So he, you know, he, where he messed up was in, in fighting oligarchs, putting people from the previous regime in jail and resolving, you know, very, very important uh, questions of the rule of law, such as the Gongadze case, the murder of the journalist. Um, in the case of Petro Poroshenko, he came to power after bloodshed on the Euromaidan. And to not put anybody in jail um, for that... Um, until now. And the same people who murdered those protesters also bankrupted Ukraine and betrayed the country. Viktor Yanukovych called for Russia to invade and annex the Crimea, um, suggests that um, his fate will be actually far worse in terms of the public perception. So where, where the documents will have a big impact um, will not be on the minutiae of did he or did he not um, infringe the law. Um, I, or I predicted to myself today that the Ukrainian prosecutor's office would say that um, there's nothing to criminally charge President Poroshenko with. At a time of, of around the world, when Australia, New Zealand, Iceland and elsewhere, there are investigations into politicians already beginning who were revealed by the Panamanian documents, the Ukrainian prosecutor's office is already saying Everything's hunky-dory, no problems. Um, so that's predictable with Ukraine's prosecutor's office. But, um, but, the, the, but he will be um, negatively impacted upon through um, the way he's going to be perceived by current Ukrainians, by historians, and also by the fact that at the next elections, his political force will be wiped out and he will be find it very difficult to be re-elected. So this is where the impact is going to be. Um, morally, of course, he can make all the arguments he wants about why there was a need to do what he did, but he didn't have to put his business into a trust in, in Panama, which has an extremely corrupt um, record, and um, the OECD and other international organizations look very negatively upon um, Panama and the Virgin Islands. He could have done it, for example, in London or in Paris or Washington, somewhere else. So he picked a very strange place. Um, secondly, he didn't hide the fact. I mean, uh, the Panamanian documents have a, have a scan of his of Petro Poroshenko's passport. Um, and thirdly, what's important is that he did this at a strange time um, when. Ukraine's um, military was in the throes of, of a major battles with, with Russia and at the time when um, there's tremendous scarcity on the ground. I mean, Ukrainians are suffering socio-economic hardships caused by the bankruptcy brought on by the Yanukovych regime and by the tough economic and financial reforms mandated by the IMF. And Ukrainian military is fighting in very difficult conditions. In March, I traveled to the front line um, of the Ukrainian conflict, um, just south of Kostyantinivka. There were major battles all around where I was um, on those three days. I traveled down with volunteers who go two to three times a month to transport um, uniforms, food, um, and other... other um, other supplies to Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, the conditions that these Ukrainian soldiers live in are disgusting often. Um, I mean, the toilets and the showers in particular. Uh, I wonder whether Canadian, American, British troops would even agree to fight if their governments neglected them so much in the same manner as Ukrainian soldiers do. 
Um, Ukraine soldiers in that sense exhibit a very high level of patriotism um, because they're not fighting for their government or president, they're fighting for their country. Uh, and without these volunteers bringing, you know, them putting their lives at risk, bringing the supplies to the front line, um, the life would be far worse for these um, soldiers. So uh, I, I just couldn't imagine Canadian troops in some foreign country or defending their own country and they don't have enough uh, food to eat and therefore civil society volunteers are bringing to the front line in Canada um, food for Canadian troops. Um, it just The mind boggles that this is happening in Ukraine. And this kind of, you know, corruption that's taking place, to give you an example, I was very surprised in the military bases to see so many uh, soldiers, Ukraine soldiers, wearing British uniforms. And I wonder, I wondered, you know, what's going on? Were they, had they been trained by the Brits or something? No, it's just that they can buy those British ex-military uniforms relatively cheaply for 800 hryvni, um, and um, they are half the price of the Ukrainian uniforms, and yet they're far better quality. Why? Better quality in terms of material, and they're also fireproof. The Ukrainian uniforms are not good quality, and they're not fireproof. And being fireproof, it's very important if you're inside, for example, an armored personnel carrier, you're hit, and you, you, you know, there's a fire, um, if that uniform can save you to get outside when you can be patted down and the fire can be put out. So it can save lives. So why is a British uniform bought from Britain half the price of a Ukrainian uniform? Corruption, of course, and the soldiers know this. And that's just many examples. So when all this is happening on the front line, and it's still happening, this kind of, kind of neglect or um, insufficient attention to the soldiers' needs who are fighting for Ukraine um, and the lack of and still continued corruption in the Ukrainian military, little wonder, therefore, that Ukrainians are going to be very angry at the fact that their president is making money by putting money, on, putting his capital off, offshore, not paying taxes and such like. Because it's the fact that people like him at the top levels of Ukrainian society who are not paying their taxes means that um, the various important government services and the Ukrainian military are starved of resources. One final question we should think, think ourselves We've often argued in the Ukrainian diaspora that um, Western governments should be supplying defensive military equipment to Ukraine, and I've argued this myself as well. Um, but we should ask ourselves whether Ukrainians, well, the Ukrainian elites, are just saying this to get a free lunch again. After all, <laughs> if we just took the money that they didn't pay on their taxes, the money that sent the billions that sent abroad each year to offshore tax havens, whether it's eleven or nine or six, it doesn't really matter. Put that together, you've got a massive military fund. I'm not even talking about other proposals where we could, in a wartime situation, demand a one-time tax levy on big business to pay into a national security fund from which arms we bought. Ukraine is not on any international arms embargo. Um, in fact, you know, at the United Nations in March of 2014, the uh, majority of countries, apart from about 10, voted on Ukraine's side. So Ukraine has every legal right in international law to go and buy arms where it wants. So it's not just a question, give, 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 as always, Ukraine leaders come to the West, give us something for free. Yes, I would like some Western governments to provide those military um, supplies to Ukraine. But at the same time, Ukrainians, uh, elites, um, want to get this for free at the same time as sending their own money abroad to avoid paying taxes into the Ukrainian budget. So there's, there's a, maybe there's a need here to bring this to the attention of Ukraine's leaders. Stop asking for free bailouts when you yourselves are sending your own capital abroad to avoid paying taxes into the Ukrainian budget. 
Um, so I, I think there's, there's there's a need for um, Western governments to be to be tougher on Ukraine as a consequence of this of these revelations. In the same way as Ukrainian citizens will be tough on Ukraine's politicians in the next upcoming elections, as they already are from today in Ukraine's media. If you look at the reactions in the media and we look at the social social media reactions, they are extremely tough and just stunned by, by this. So it doesn't really matter what you, Poroshenko's lawyers, accountants or anybody comes up with excuses. The damage has already been done because it always goes back to public perception. Public perception here is extremely bad. Thank you.